those people are um, are signing on. Um, can uh, kind of just uh, give a brief overview. I think you know, just as a reminder from uh, the email we sent out uh, a few weeks ago about what we're what our agenda is today. Um, and thanks everyone for adding your name to the attendance list. Um, so we are planning on talking about two documents today uh, in specific. Um, so one of those is the Digital Preservation Declaration of Shared Values. Uh, that has been, I guess it's been out there for a few months now in its current draft form. It's a, re a revision of version three. Um, from the Digital Preservation Service Collaborative. And then uh, there's a document that we had intended to discuss at the last meeting, um, which is actually um, a kind of a, a service provider agnostic version of a charter that Preservica has come up with. Um, and it's a charter on digital preservation sustainability. So, um, I think these two documents, um, and it, you know, our, our general intention is is to kind of, uh, as as uh, was mentioned in the email, kind of put on our, our infrastructure hats and uh, take a you know critical look at these documents um, to see what some of the um, ideas expressed in them uh, actually mean, and you know, at the crossroads of infrastructure, and uh, specifically, um, you know what that means for different organizations uh, when it comes to evolving that infrastructure, putting it in place um, and anything, you know, any of the experiences that we have here would be great to talk about uh, with regard to those. So um, quite a few folks uh, signed on the past like a um, couple minutes. So I'm going to post the running notes doc again. And then I will also, um, post uh, links to both of those documents we just mentioned um, as well. But just um, to start off with some housekeeping, um, uh, again, thanks for adding your name to the attendance list. Above that, um, if you look at the running notes document, uh, we've posted some information about the NDSA code of conduct. And um, we also have a link to a uh, supporting website in the agenda. Um, so you can take a look at that after the meeting if you'd like. But essentially, we'd like to just review the code of conduct um, that NDSA follows. And it's provided through uh, the DLF um, and uh, as the Council of Library and Information Resources acts as the host organization for both DLF and NDSA. So we've collaborated on uh, the code of conduct here, um, but it's just a, it's important to note, um, you know, if there's any incident that occurs during you know one of our interest group meetings, not this, you know, obviously not only the infrastructure interest group, but the uh, the other two as well, um, you know, feel free to you know reach out to either Robin or I uh, to you know discuss any uh, you know any information you want to point out about that incident. Um, and we can follow up. Um, and then, you know, if there is an anonymous form that you can provide information through. Um, and of course, there's also uh, an email address that we're providing here, uh, conduct at ndsa.org. Um, that's monitored by both the chair and the vice chair of the coordinating committee of NDSA. So uh, those are just, you know, different ways that you can reach out to us uh, in case, um, you know, there's any sort of, um, code of conduct related issue that comes up in any of our uh, interest group meetings. So I wanted to mention that. Uh, Robin, is there anything else you wanted to bring up around that? No, I think you covered it. Um, and, it, you know, people don't have to do every single thing in that list, but pick what you're comfortable with. Yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, it, you yeah. know, Everybody should feel like they can uh, reach out if they want. And of course, everybody should feel comfortable uh, whenever we're going through any of our meetings here. So um, any questions on that from folks? All right. So um, 
I also wanted to mention uh, uh, as part of the agenda. So we've got these two documents we want to chat about. Um, then also uh, near the end of the meeting, uh, I'd like to just uh, mention the uh, project mycelium uh, call for feedback. Uh, we can spend a few minutes on that too. So let's get started with um, the Digital Preservation Declaration of Shared Values. And let me grab a link to that, to the HTML, to the actual web page, post that. And what I ended up doing uh, just to um, have a bunch of uh, points to kind of go through is I actually just downloaded both of these documents and created PDFs out of them. Uh, so if y'all don't mind, I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and, uh, and share uh, my screen that, and we can use these PDFs as, uh, as ways to both comment and kind of highlight different uh, areas in the documents. Okay. Can everyone see um, that first document? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, great. Thanks. And so let me grab Zoom controls here, which are, of course, doing their own thing. So So to start off with the preservation declaration of shared values, um, let's see. Um, I think what I, you know, when going through this document, um, I ended up kind of taking a look at specific statements uh, through each section. So there are, uh, you know, a whole series of sections. There's the collaboration section. Uh, this affordability and sustainability, the inclusiveness section, environment heterogeneity, sorry, uh, section and um, portability and interoperability, openness and transparency and accountability and stewardship continuity, advocacy as well and empowerment all the way down to the bottom here. So I don't know how many folks um, had a chance to uh, attend IPRES either uh, in person or, or remotely. Um, but I, you know, looking through this initial collaboration uh, section, um, you know, one of the things that jumped out at me was the resource intensive uh, and contributes to global warming statement here. Um, and I, you know, I'd love to hear what other folks have to say uh, about, um, you know, environmental impact of preservation as we've, we've brought that up in past discussions and everything. Um, but there was one presentation at IPRES uh, that I'm trying to get in touch with the actual presenter at Virginia Tech, um, but I found it fascinating in terms of the amount of information that they were able to, uh, to come up with, like specific information about uh, the impact of our fixity, like our fixity checking services in different repositories. And um, just, to, uh, just to mention here, um, the NDSA fixity survey that's, you know, that has appeared regularly, uh, one of the things that was mentioned during this presentation uh, was that back in 2017, um, the percentage of individuals who replied to that survey who said they were running fixity was around 84%. And then by last year, it jumped up to 98%. And, you know, personally, I can say that, you know, from like in our repository uh, at CDL, like we're, we're constantly, as the amount of content increases, we're constantly battling, uh, you know, our kind of fixity check cycle and making sure it doesn't go over 90 days. Um, but, you know, this presentation uh, kind of turned my thoughts around on that. Um, and they were, you know, they, they were mentioning anything from, and this is, uh, the presentation was by Alan and Alex um, at Virginia Tech Libraries, but they were mentioning anything from, you know, which 
checksum calculations were at least like power consumptive um, to trying to approximate like uh, or estimate how many kilograms of like CO2 emission was generated when checking on both local and cloud storage. Um, and they came up with this, um, this figure where for 33 and a half terabytes of data, um, that's around 86 kilograms of CO2 emissions. And that's the, also the equivalent of a little over four gallons of gas used or 4,500 different smartphones charged. There's actually an EPA greenhouse gas calculator. Um, so I just, you know, numbers like these are just things that make you, at least in, 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 you know, in my mind, you know, want to go back and actually really dedicate time to trying to estimate the impact that, you know, in, in this case, fixity checking services actually have uh, with regard to the environment. Um, I'll just stop there, uh, there just to see if other, uh, other people have opinions they'd like to share about the collaboration section. All right, let's see. So other, other parts that um, I ended up highlighting uh, under affordability and sustainability, um, you know, there's some, some really great statements here about, you know, what it means that digital preservation is expensive for organizations while also involving heavy investments of labor and technological infrastructure that draw significantly on nat our natural resources and contributes to climate change, um, kind of like dovetailing to the previous point. Um, one of the, in this second like bullet right here about the balance of organizational needs for affordability with the long-term sustainability of technologies and service models, like one of the things that's come across our minds recently um, is really what does it mean to have the infrastructure that you're working with at your organization um, have it operating at like an optimal level. Um, we have started to really think about this, uh, not only from an environmental impact uh, um, angle, but also from, you know, first and foremost, really like the expense of compute, the expense of storage, um, you know, the amount of investment we have, you know, through staff and everything to maintain all of that. Um, but we, we, you know, there's this notion of continuing to push forward on the performance of every aspect of a preservation repository. Um, you know, being able to move a certain number of terabytes every, you know, on a daily basis, um, or a certain number of, you know, gigabytes on a daily basis. Um, how much, you know, what is your fixity check cycle for the for all of the content across all the different like replicates you have in different storage providers um, or, you know, local storage. Um, you know, do you want that to be 90 days or less? Do you want that to be 120 days uh, to minimize your impact? What is, you know, what are the thoughts behind that and what's optimal? Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's started this whole kind of like thought process of really, um, you know, what, what does all that mean? Um, let's see. All right, I'm looking through the chat right now. So yeah, definitely uh, just kind of going back up to Paul's comment. Yeah, that was Alex Kinnaman's presentation, um, which was awesome. And uh, let's see. So in terms of recordings, um, okay, yeah. Thanks, Hannah, for bringing up that the paper's linked. And um, 
I know there is a portal for the recordings for folks who attended IPRES that's available until October 16th, I think, if you wanted to review the actual presentations live or the actual recordings. Um, so, right, um, Martha, you'd mentioned could fix fixie checks be staggered? Yeah, there's definitely the notion of do we need to be running these all the time? Do we need to be fixie checking everything all the time? Or could we actually, you know, check a certain number of objects or randomize, you know, or, you know, check certain collections at a certain time and skip others? Um, you know, there, there are definitely different approaches there. Um, just out, I mean, out of curiosity, what do folks find themselves like? Um, I mean, what approaches are they taking to fix the? Are they like, do they do they find or do you, do you all find that running fixity all the time is the the most reassuring um, approach? Or do you also find that, you know, the notion of staggering or, you know, randomly checking certain certain content, but not all content um, is, you know, a preferred approach. I'll just kind of leave leave that out there as a question. And I just say, um, you know, at least in my case, as collections continue to increase, what is working for me is staggering and also prioritizing my, my collections. I, I really don't see the point of uh, running fixed checks on all collections, let's say every month. Mm -hmm. um, and mainly because I'm concerned with the um, impact on our planet. Right. And I. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, I think it depends on the uh, size of the total uh, of the collections, because when you hit multiple terabytes or hundreds of terabytes, it's just not feasible to do the fixity checking all the time. Right, right. And I just saw Courtney comment. Um, Think, yeah, my third degree, and I'm so happy to hear you say it. We need more and better approaches to appraisal and prioritization of content. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Corey. Well, thank you so much, um, Eric. I'm also wondering, you know, I, I heard a really interesting um, presentation at uh, Open Repositories this year from, I believe it was the folks at University of Virginia who had built um, some fixity functionality using serverless um, stuff on Amazon. And that might also be a way of looking at this when you can actually deploy fixity um, without having to run like a, a dedicated VM through this kind of ser this new serverless methodology. It, it might be kind of neat to reach out to them and just sort of see um, if they have thought of the environmental impacts of that. I'm pretty sure that was Andrew Dominan. He's on the call. Andrew, was that your presentation? Um, yeah, we didn't actually implement that, but I pointed to two different implementations, um, one from Google and one from um, AWS. Um, yeah, that allow you to to run fixity on demand without having to run your own servers. I'm not totally sure if that is more resource efficient or more cost efficient than, um, than running dedicated systems to do that. Uh, in, in our case, in AP Trust's case, it wouldn't be more cost efficient and probably not more resource efficient um, because we are running checks round the clock on um, a very large set of materials. But for others who want to, who, who are working with a smaller set of materials or only want to run checks on um, a subset of their collections, 
um, it could be a good way to go. Could definitely be cheaper in terms of um, development time and probably cheaper in terms of what you're going to pay to AWS or Google Cloud to actually run those things. Um, in terms of resources, I, I think it's going to be similar. The cost of running a check is going to be similar on a per file basis, whether you're running it on your own server or running it using a, like a, a Lambda or some serverless technology. So I guess the rule of thumb is um, the scale, as, as the scale of your fixity checking goes up, your resource usage is going to go up similarly either way you do it, server or serverless. Um, I have a link to that paper somewhere too. I'll try to find it and put it in the chat. Yeah, that was uh, a really great um, presentation. I'm, I'm also wondering, you know, just generally with uh, the major cloud service providers, um, if they if they have any options, and again, we don't really use that too much up here, but if they have any options for using data centers that are more environmentally I don't know, friendly, um, if you're able to pick uh, or even understand where the different regions and the environmental impact of having computation storage uh, in different regions. Right, that's a that's a very good point. And um, I think that is another that was covered in a little bit in Alex's presentation uh, as well, just because they mentioned the notion of AWS uh, kind of, you know, surfacing their uh, amount of impact on the environment and with different uh, different metrics. I can't I can't remember exactly, um, but there was a, a they were trying to enable customers to kind of like judge their reduced impact, quote unquote, on the environment. Um, for a specific data center. And I don't know if that was really, I can't remember if it was data center specific, region specific or, or both, but yeah. Um, but then it kind of, like, like you're saying, it's like, then it becomes um, how, you know, the question of how do you compare, you know, on an apples to apples basis with other service providers? So, um, you know, it's like they're, the methods used to bubble up those metrics from Amazon, they'd have to be relatively similar to methodology used by other service providers um, like Google or Wasabi or um, yeah, uh, Microsoft. I mean, it's that, that type of standardization would be wonderful to like kind of have some sort of say on or say, say about. Um, So, you know, the big cloud providers know that um, electricity is one of their major costs and um, traditional server processors used in traditional servers uh, are very resource intensive. They use a lot of electricity. Amazon has actually started designing their own chips and um, some of these data centers are moving more towards ARM chips. Those are the kinds that power phones and tablets that use very little electricity, um, but traditionally haven't been powerful enough to run server workloads. They're now, um, ARM is creeping up in terms of performance where they actually are starting to be able to handle server workloads. And even the new Mac M1 and M2 chips are ARM chips and they perform very well. So the, the big providers, um they are looking at at the issue of their electrical usage because it's um for them it's just it's really a cost issue i don't they may tout how they're becoming more environmentally friendly by starting to design their own power efficient chips but realistically um they want to be able to reduce their costs so things are potentially moving in a good direction there um but yeah, those, I don't think any of the 
big providers are transparent about how much energy they're really using and how much of it is renewable. Right, right. The renewable uh, element to it is also super important. But that's really, really, I mean, thanks for mentioning that, Andrew. It's like really interesting to hear that there's significant effort going on in terms of using a different type of chip in terms of using the ARM chips. Um, because that would be, depending on how, what the whole, you know, investment is for uh, the large cloud providers to actually bring those chips online and into, you know, service, like, um, you know, you would, you would hope, one would hope that they're willing, and it sounds like they are, they're willing to kind of like take on the initial like impact of all that cost and investment um, to lower their, their long-term like costs uh, in electricity. So uh, I see that in the chat, um, Scott was asking, do we need to run fixity on objects stored in storage arrays that offer built-in fixity, um, self-healing, et cetera? So, I mean, I, uh, yeah, does anybody have input on that? Because I think, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me really is, is the quote unquote 11 nines of durability that, you know, all the large cloud providers uh, aim for or try or, or say that state that they're adhering to. Um, but then self healing is also built into different, um, you know, technology stacks as well. Um, if you think about, um, you know, clocks or anything like that. So um, that's a whole nother aspect. Oh, I have some thoughts on that. I don't mean to dominate, but I have thought about this. Um, those, uh, you know, 11 nines of durability, the services that AWS and Google and others offer um, and also the, the self-healing that you see in these storage arrays, they generally work as advertised. And I think there's a, there's a case to run fixity. There are two cases to run fixity in those situations. One is to do spot checks. You know, maybe you're running fixity on 10% of your collections or less, just to make sure that um, nothing is really going wrong there, right? So you have some mm -hmm. warning if a spot check fails you're using much less electricity, but you, you do get a warning if something's wrong. Then the other case is there are certain organizations that may have to um, prove fixity um, to their depositors or whoever they're holding materials for. And um, if you're doing explicit fixity checks, you can prove, you can say, look, here's the evidence. We ran a check on this file last week and this is the checksum we came up with. So we don't have to pull down the whole file and show you it's intact. Right, right. And that's, that's also, um, you know, that, that kind of brings to mind the working with Amazon Glacier, uh, you know, issue in our, at least, you know, for us, it's an issue because we're not pulling content from Glacier to fix the checkout. All we're doing is we're literally like taking a look at the the header that we get back and some metadata that's there, um, and ensuring that you know the 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 actual checksum matches what we have uh, in our database, rather than you know rerunning it on content that we pulled from you know from Glacier. So that's. That's a constant. I mean, now I know we've talked about that before here as well. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about this uh, quite a bit. As in the second case that you uh, mentioned, you know, uh, proving that you've done fixity, it feels like that's a kind of trusted digital repository requirement that predates cloud environments and cloud vendors and archival storage systems. And I wonder how useful that is anymore as a requirement that you must prove that you have done fixity. Um, but again, it kind of depends on, well, how much do you trust the uh, 
the cloud provider. I'm thinking in the first case of doing spot checks, I could see how that kind of spot check might uh, capture some kind of global corruption or widespread corruption, but the chances of catching a, uh, a bit flip on that one file at that one point in time that isn't caught by the system is probably pretty low, you know, close to infinitesimal. I was just talking about it this morning in another meeting and um, suggesting that perhaps we do fixity as soon as we deposit something just to make sure that what we deposited is complete and correct and what we think it is that we deposited. And then we do fixity on the other end when we construct a dip or something to just make sure that what we're delivering uh, to the person is um, what was stored on it, but perhaps not doing any fixing while it's at rest on this uh, cloud storage array. Right, right. And there's, there's, um, oh, Corey, uh, go ahead. Thanks. Well, thank you. I, I, I was just going to quickly mention um, we've been talking with um, our local advanced research computing folks about using their um, OpenStack Swift object storage. And um, again, I'm going to demonstrate my ignorance here, but I think the, the sort of the data scrubbing to prevent um, data corruption, I'm not sure at what level of abstraction that happens at. So they felt that fixity checking on sort of the objects or the things that are of value to us, like the apes and the stuff that are in that might still have value, um, even if they're doing all this sort of data scrubbing at the, at a, I'm not even sure if it happens at the level of sort of abstraction or if it just happens on the actual storage infrastructure. So I think there is some value there, but I'm really interested to kind of get a better sense of how sort of modern enterprise computing um, might do a lot of this work for us, um, you know, and it, so I think it's a really interesting conversation. Yeah, there's, you know, there, there's, that's a, that's a really good point in terms of like, you know, what we care about and the actual objects um, and, you know, what level of abstraction we're talking about. Um, I mean, I, and, and working with what, you know, just one, one last thing to mention, um, just from uh, the CDL re repository perspective is that when working with our dev team, uh, there's, there's this concern that um, occasionally we will see uh, a failure in our fixity checks that's not that's, that's we haven't seen much if that if anything recently in terms of like actual bit rot um, but we have seen the possibility of an issue with or issues with new changes introduced to the actual repository software um, you know accidentally causing the corruption of a file and that is a whole different um, kind of different avenue into this conversation, but it's also something that uh, dovetails with what Scott was saying is, you know, checking fixity like right after something is written to storage to make sure that what you put there is exactly what you think it is. Um, because for us, that's in recent memory anyway, what, um, what has impacted us the most because we made some change that maybe didn't support encoding or I mean supported encoding but we hit a new file type or you know a new character um, that you know ended up making us replicate an existing object to some storage somewhere and not quite the right way um, and we end up finding out but it's also you know it's good we found out right when it happened so So let's see, we've got, uh, let's, it is a little after, let's see, 12.35 or so. Um, let's move on uh, going through here. Um, you know, some of the things that I highlighted, uh, and, and again, if anybody has anything else they want to kind of gravitate towards, um, I mean, please, please holler. 
uh, I think I just went through here to, to kind of highlight certain points of interest. Um, okay, there, uh, my PDF display has finally kind of come back. So it's good practice that digital preservation be technologically distributed across different infrastructures, software platforms, and geographies. Um, this goes on to say there's, uh, you know, for-profit technology monopolies have little interest in the priorities of a relatively small community like ours and cultural heritage institutions. Um, so from that standpoint, there's a risk that the lack of interest could result in loss of valuable content when we rely on, on one provider. Um, this goes on to say backwards compatibility is a very high priority for us, while for-profit sector constantly pushes forward with acceptable levels of obsolescence. And the reason I highlighted, especially that last uh, bit there, is because when I start looking at the other document we were thinking of, of reviewing today, um, Preservica's uh, um, statements on preservation sustainability in their charter, there is a lot of this give and take between their intention or a, in general, a service provider's intention, I should say, to advance their technology and provide more, you know, either more features or I would say even, um, actually in that charter, they mentioned keeping like core preservation related functionality as simple as possible and introducing automation there where needed. You know, when you hear statements like that and then you think about the, if you think about backwards compatibility or file format migration or um, you know, all the things that we care about, there's, there's, it's definitely a way to see that there are two sides of the, of the coin there and some conflict of interest um, between, as we're saying, as, you know, as stated here that, you know, there's, there's constant push forward, whereas, you know, that might not be exactly what we want to see happen based on our priorities and cultural heritage institutions. So um, that's mainly why I, you know, I, I find these these two points really, really valuable. So, um, oh yeah, hey, hey Robin, I know you have to go. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Sorry, it's good conversation. All right, we'll see you next time. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention, highlight those points um, in terms of the environment and see this, the next section on portability or interoperability has many, many good things to say as well. In my opinion, I think um, this, really this, you know, the speaking a common language being imperative, uh, I think is, is a great highlight because what is a common and it, and the points here go on to kind of like add detail and context, but you know what is a common language uh, in terms of um, being able to interoperate? You know, does that mean? And I just made a couple of simple like the high level notes here: common API layers. Um, you know, like we're always thinking about the S three S three compatibility um, for an API layer over any kind of storage we use um, to keep things you know, as simple as possible for our services. Um, but then you can, you can kind of go in many different directions from there. One being, you know, object definitions or, you know, standards that are being, that have been introduced in the past, you know, few years, including OCFL um, and of course the longstanding Bagot. Uh, but then, you know, those, those are parts of the common language. And um, what does that, what do those bring to the table in terms of interoperability? They bring a lot. So um, down here, there's mention of developing software that interacts with, with various systems, but still provides the end user with the required assurance, um, it, you know, is a core component of our services. So, yeah, I think I will, I'll stop there and see if, um, if anybody wants to chime in in terms of this, you know, speaking common, a common language across 
uh, many different aspects of you know both infrastructure and policy and approach um, to preservation. So any strategy. So can I open up the floor for comments? Okay, let's see. So moving on, um, the openness and transparency. Um, I think, you know, one of the challenges that, and, and I, you know, embracing open source software is, yeah, uh, you know, it's something that, that, um, you know, and, and from my perspective is uh, very, very important. Um, and especially, so I, I highlight it openly documented um, because I've been with, you know, currently, the, you know, our, our organization, we, most everything we have is open source and it's out there on GitHub. The previous organization I was with several years ago um, also took this very seriously. Uh, and they were, you know, they were building uh, a journal publishing platform um, and that you know both then and now I've seen the notion that documentation is key and actually documentation uh, is something that takes a lot of time to do uh, right or to the point where it, making use of that open source software with appropriate supporting documentation like it's you know if you don't have enough detail enough context enough access to the community that's actually developing that the community needs to be active uh, all those elements that go into open source software are you know intertwined and so i think it's just it's great to mention how things really need to be openly documented and um, just kind of thinking along the community that's actually developing that software, having that be an active, active and like open community to engage with. Uh, so I wanted to bring up those points. Um, the accountability section, um, you know, talking about these services, commit to sharing information on data loss and lessons learned. Um, I did want to kind of bring up uh, another presentation that uh, that I saw recently uh, from the Core Trust Seal uh, organization. And they are um, they're in the process, you know, for trusted repositories for actually folks who are interested in uh, working with Core Trust Seal. Um, they're currently revising their their requirements for certification. And um, they're also, and I know actually uh, maybe at least one person here, let's see. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe not. Um, folks who are, you know, they're, they're recruiting reviewers as well uh, for repositories that are submitting for certification. And I think they just brought up some really good points in their presentation with the notion that becoming a reviewer uh, for a certification process actually brings with it a lot of advantages. And some of those being that, you know, you're seeing firsthand uh, and able to provide firsthand feedback on how a repository is um, approaching some of those requirements in the certification. But then, you know, that just all blends, in, it just moves everything forward. Like that feedback, that knowledge um, is kind of distributed back out into the community um, because all these certifications are made public after they're done. Um, and so it's just this kind of ever evolving process that has a community engagement element to it built in, which I thought, you know, meant the mention of that uh, from the Core Trust SEAL organization was really important. So, uh, and again, it kind of like ties back to having services committing to sharing information when things are going well and also things when things are not going well and there's data loss and there are lessons to be learned, so.
All right, so we are closing in a uh, little after 12.45. So the stewardship and continuity statements that are here, um, yeah, I just, I mean, these are, these are great. Uh, and I, you know, highlighted a few here, but um, just the, the notion of like service providers should be operating as if they will not be around forever. I think it's something we take for granted, but it's always important to stress and actually uh, to point out and bring up here in this declaration. And the like-mindedness of organizations is, is incredibly important, uh, excuse me, important in my opinion. Um, and the lack of competition versus working together, um, those, are, those are also huge. Let me take a pause there to see if anybody uh, would like to comment. Okay, let's see. Advocacy. Yeah, I think the main, well, the one note here I mentioned kind of goes back into uh, environmental impact in my mind, but um, these are, you know, specific highlights about advocacy that are, you know, that come, that are present in our everyday work. Um, uh, the, you know, the notion of like preservation, not seeming as immediately attractive to stakeholders versus acquisition and exhibit. Um, but it's, you know, absolutely a responsibility of cultural heritage institutions uh, that are committed to acquiring and collecting digital content. And then in terms of empowerment, um, I think this kind of like uh, this note down here about decisions should be made by a preservationist equipped with the required knowledge and empowered to decide which preservation path to take based on, uh, on the materials at hand, not because they are the default setting in a software program. So um, that says a whole lot. Uh, and I think that also kind of like just works right into some of the other aspects of the uh, of the other document we were going to review. And I think we probably don't have a whole heck of a lot of time to review the, that document, but um, I will, uh, we can start on that. Um, are there any other comments in terms of the declaration? I, I actually had a question about that very last Thing you just read are there i mean i'm not familiar with some of the commercial software out there but does some of that software force you to just run with their default settings and kind of tell you you're going to do it this way because that's how we do it oh that's that's a really good question i mean i i got the impression um from the Preservica Sustainability Charter that they're they are making efforts to you know make decisions uh, with regard to preservation you know more straightforward. Um, I don't know if that means that you know they're building in certain defaults that may or may not impact those decisions. It's a really good really good question. I I don't have much experience in that realm either. So be um, happy to hear anybody else who wants to chime in. So yeah, Courtney. I'll, I'll try to be quick, Eric. Um, uh, I think um, in, as one of the um, contributing authors to this document, first I want to say thank you so much for those of you who are here to engage with it, and Eric for your comments and input in particular. Um, 
I would love to have a copy of your PDF <laughs> with all of your comments so that it can contribute. We're going to keep it open a little bit longer, um, probably past the uh, American Thanksgiving holiday, um, because we'll have a discussion in person at a panel, uh, a digital preservation reckoning um, at the DLF forum. So we hope to see at least some of you there to have a broader discussion on a lot of these topics. Um, I think this particular part that we're talking about here um, was a kind of reaction to what we have been noticing in terms of automation language across a lot of the um, proprietary vendors um, working on digital preservation systems. And that trend towards automation, I think, is what drove us to make this statement um, because automation kind of gets sold as a universal good. Um, and, and this was our way of expressing why that might not be so. And, and please, those others um, who are here from the group, if you'd like to correct me, please do. But I think that I, I do think that reflects what we were thinking. Oh, Hannah, thanks, Courtney. Um, yeah, so I, I am also a contributing author on this, and I think that um, I agree with everything that Courtney said, and I think that um, the way that this entire ties into empowerment too is that you know I think that automation is uh, very kind of desirable from a marketing perspective but is um, maybe in some ways indirectly or directly a devaluation of the labor and expertise that goes into making decisions about what actions to perform. Um, so, and I think that at least in my experience with some of these vendor products, there's not necessarily, uh, like you're forced to just do it one way. I think that there is some customizability, but, um, the, there's kind of, there is a, a default that is, um, like pretty heavily, uh, recommended. So that, at least in my experience. Okay. Thank you guys for answering that. And I'm, I'm really glad uh, y'all are here as well. Um, so uh, definitely, you know, so Courtney, you mentioned the, the document would be open for comment a little bit longer. Yeah, I'm so. supposed to send out a message um, <laughs> and I haven't yet, but, um, and I will, I promise this week, everyone here um, that we're going to extend it past the Thanksgiving holiday. And that's largely because we'll have an open discussion at our panel at DLF about it. But please do continue engaging with the online document, leave your comments. And if you're more comfortable reaching out to us directly, you're um, welcome to email any of us individually or the DPSC um, email address. Sounds good. And Hannah just mentioned, I'll update the data on the GitHub site now. All right, great. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so yeah, we, we are pretty much out of time. Um, so I, you know, we can save the charter for the next meeting, um, start off our conversation around it. Um, but I also, let me go ahead and stop sharing for the moment. Uh, I also did want to mention in, um, the agenda here. Uh, that there's a third bullet point, um, and it's regarding Project Mycelium. Uh, this is actually uh, a call for feedback that Nathan Tallman uh, had put out to NDSA, to the infrastructure group uh, a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago. Um, and so uh, I'm sure they would love uh, folks' feedback on the design document if you had some time to review it and also learn more about the project. Uh, so I did want to to mention that here. Um, yeah, let's see. Okay. All right. Well, I will. Let's see. Just wanted to open up the floor again for any uh, any comments um, and uh, last minute thoughts. Um, but yeah, it's been great to see everybody. Um, let me pause there. See if we have some uh, uh, some final thoughts from anybody. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, it was a great discussion. And uh, the infrastructure group uh, has another meeting later this year in December. So 
Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there and we'll put out some more information about uh, the topic that meeting uh, between now and then. So thanks again and great to see you and we'll see you next time.